Welcome to Bones MMA Talkie. I am Big Willie, aka Hook Nose, aka Punga Stumps, aka One Take Willie. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about shadow boxing. I'm going to explain uh, why we do shadow boxing and provide some uh, tools uh, and provide some comfort to those who might feel a little bit off put when they first step into a gym and uh, are asked to do three minutes of shadow boxing because it can be pretty awkward and I can remember that feeling. But at no stage uh, am I suggesting that shadow boxing is just for beginners. Uh, one of the most famous uh, fighters of all time, Joachim Porn, who had the awesome fight name of Elbow Hunter of 100 Stitches, he at the upper echelons of Muay Thai and Limpini in the golden era was shadow boxing 20 minutes a day. I don't think it's something that uh, we can skip or, or compromise on. I think it's a must for all levels uh, of Muay Thai development. Joachim Porn, in fact, was, he's from the, grew up in the northern area of uh, Thailand. And it wasn't until the age of 20 that he actually had access to proper gym equipment. So he's from a very poor part of the country in Asan, and what uh, Muay Thai training used to uh, look like for him was they were either shadow boxing outside in the courtyard, outside in the temple, or when the farmers brought through fertilizer sacks, uh, the, the young Thai boys would empty them out, fill them with sand and punch those until they broke. So a large part of his development and his success could be recognized in the fact that through lack of training equipment, he was forced to shadow box. Shadow boxing for me is an opportunity to uh, calibrate all the different uh, rhythms and, and timings and weapons in terms of range and, and direction and traje trajectory. Uh, so I spend a lot of time even, even now as someone who doesn't train a lot, shadow boxing just to play with different rhythms and timing. If you can remember the first time, for those of you that are old enough to drive, the first time you ever uh, drove a car, the first time you hopped in a car, you'd remember how clunky and awkward it would have felt. Before you hopped in that car, you knew what a car was and you knew, had some idea of how it worked, but you didn't yet know how to drive it competently. And when you're coming to a gym and you're asked to shadow box, that's kind of like you hopping in the car. That's conscious incompetence. I know that I don't know how to do this yet. And then you hop in the car and you're doing your learner's license with, you know, um, you know, Gary, the driving instructor from the creepy driving instructor from up the road. And he's, you know, getting you to check your rear vision mirror every 10 seconds and you're constantly checking uh, how fast you're going and uh, you're going through all these system checks in your head. But you're having to do it consciously and that's conscious competence. I'm doing it, I haven't crashed the car yet, but I'm thinking around what I'm doing. And this is a stage of learning that you progress through when you do shadow boxing. And the only thing that makes you more proficient at that to a level where you can drive the car from, you know, Lara to Torquay and not crash that and go, shit, how did I get here? Is repetition. So the same way that you accrue hours in a car, uh, you accrue hours in shadow boxing, and you start to develop your style, calibrate your rhythm, calibrate your timing. There's this really great word in, uh, that embodies a concept in Thai called Jung Wah. Jung Wah means a combination of rhythm and timing, but more importantly, and probably on a deeper level, it means knowing the right time, understanding the right time to throw a strike. Shadow boxing is perfect for that because that's true to your own rhythm. You develop a rhythm and then from that base and from that rhythm, you understand the right time to throw a strike. The, something that underpins that, a concept that kind of clicks into that, like two systems clicking and combining together is jarit. Jarit means don't rush. It doesn't mean do it slow, but it means to do it with purpose and be deliberate in your actions. And when we're shadow boxing, while slow is smooth and smooth is fast and probably starting slow is best, as you become more proficient at it, you should be shadow boxing as you fight. So you should be doing it with the same intensity as you fight. Go back, do yourself a favor and find some old golden era footage of Joachim Porn shadow boxing. And you'll see a man covered in sweat, 
uh, 20 minutes in, who's throwing strikes violently uh, while calibrating all his weapons. So, the way that we're gonna prescribe the shadow boxing routine, uh, or the, the system that I want you to run through, is to start by focusing first on your agility. Focus first on your feet. We're gonna do two rounds of these, this. If you go and build, uh, so you get, you know, uh, you, your great, great grandma dies and you get left a small fortune, uh, but it's tied up in Nigeria and you pay, a, you pay a small fee and you manage to attract that money and you go and build a fancy house, you can build the fanciest house in the world, but if the foundation isn't uh, strong, that's gonna blow over in the, uh, in, the, in the first tremor or the first strong breeze. So, you can have all the fancy spinning crap in the world, but if you don't know how to move your feet, then you're gonna be in trouble. We're gonna do two rounds of agility footwork where you're going to ensure a couple of things. You're gonna ensure that at any point in time you're not too heavy on one foot. You're gonna practice making sure that the weight is off your heel. It's more of a sensory thing than a pronounced thing, so you're not coming up on tippy toes, but you're making sure your weight's not on your heel. You're gonna be checking that when you take an angle or when you move forward or when you move backwards that your base doesn't narrow, that your feet maintain the same uh, length apart and you're gonna practice mixing up your rhythm and mixing up your timing. So don't be too predictable by rhythm stepping and allow your opponent to get a sense of your rhythm because then they can time you. All right, now that we've got our base sorted, we're gonna start to bring the first of our strikes and we're gonna stick with our, our moi, we're gonna stick with our boxing. So we're gonna do two more rounds. Now, now that we've uh, become aware of what our feet are doing, we've got a base, we're gonna start throwing boxing strikes only. Offense and defense, we're gonna be mixing through our long range punches, so our jabs and our crosses. We're gonna be going through our mid range weapons, so our hooks and our uppercuts and our rips to the body. And we're gonna be mixing up our rhythm and our timing with these strikes. So we're not throwing them uh, all at the same pace or all on the same beat. Think about uh, playing a song in your head and select something from the good old days. Pick a, like, a blues track or uh, like some burning spare, some old reggae, anything at like 60 to 80 uh, beats per minute. Chuck it on, chuck it on a speaker and try and find those half beats in the rhythm and make sure that some of the strikes are coming, uh, landing on those half beats and some are uh, landing on the end of the bar. Mix up your strikes and don't be too predictable with your pattern. Two rounds, let's go. Okay, we've got our base sorted. We've started to bring in our boxing. Next, we're gonna do two rounds, introducing kicks. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna mix through our range. We're gonna implement our long range kicking techniques, our teeps, our roundhouse kicks, kicking to, uh, kicking to the head. We're going to mix in our mid range kicking techniques. So low kicks, on the outside, inside, low kicks. If you know your style, and if you understand what your style is, this is where you start to find it. You start to find where your kicks uh, fall in place behind your strikes, where your, where your kicks are best served in terms of uh, in what position do you want your feet to throw them. This is where you start to develop your jungwa, understanding the right time. And remember, Jarip, don't rush. Be deliberate in everything you do. Make sure what you're doing is specific. All right, now we're getting to the juicy stuff. So we're gonna to start to bring in our cow, our knee, not an actual cow, that would be weird. And there's a sign at the front that says no farm animals on the mat. I'm into animal husbandry, but only if it means marrying a sheep, not bringing them into the uh, goddamn gym. So cow and sock. Uh, we're gonna start to bring in our elbows. Knee and elbow strikes work in unison. One shouldn't really exist without the other. So we're gonna start to mix up our knees and our elbows. Now, to throw those, we need to have the tools to transition through the range. Many people, when they get the first opportunity to throw elbows, they start throwing them from 10,000 miles away and it's not gonna work unless you've got a really good throwing arm. So we're gonna need tools to transition from long range to close range. Imagine there's another opponent in front of you and they're also trying to hit and punch you. So you're gonna to need to control their hands on the way in and you're gonna to need to find a home for the elbow. When you're throwing your elbows and your knees, 
Relax your body, sabai sabai. Jai yin yin, have a cool heart when you're doing that. Relax your body, make sure you're coming up on your toes when you're throwing your knees, and make sure that you're, when you're throwing your elbows, they're not coming from your hips, that your shoulders are loose inside the socket and you're throwing those elbows to cut. Fun sock is not something you find under your bed. It's a sideways elbow behind the head. Throw your uh, sock nut, your sock club, spinning elbows and up elbows and pretend to throw elbows from hand pummels inside the clinch. Okay, now that we've brought all the weapons in, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a bit of a challenge. And this is something that will really, uh, will, will really challenge even those amongst us who are advanced. So now what we're doing is we're hopping in the car, we're hopping in the car and we are driving from Lara to Melbourne without thinking around what, what, uh, what we're doing. So we're gonna try and slip into some unconscious competence. I'm not thinking about it, but I'm doing it. So you're gonna put an opponent in front of you in your mind, and you're gonna throw all of your weapons in, and you're gonna be throwing it with full pace. As the, uh, your imaginary opponent is throwing strikes at you, you're looking to segment the fight into tiny little wins, an accumulation of segments of the fight, segmentation, rather than uh, thinking about the fight as three giant pieces of pizza, which represent rounds, each one of those pieces of pizza is sliced into a hundred finely cut little slices. And each one of those is representative of a they have a go, I have a go. We can think about it in terms of words in a sentence and on the strikes and feints and movement that we have back and forth is the words in the sentence, I'm trying to put the exclamation point on the end. So as you're having this imaginary battle with your opponent, uh, try and put that exclamation point on the end. Here's the trick. You're gonna have to have good footwork, uh, good agility. You're gonna be have to mix through your boxing. You'll need to have a good understanding of range when you're landing your kicks and you need to transition in and out of range to land knees and elbows. And again, remember Jari, don't rush, be deliberate and be specific. And uh, Jung Wa, understand the right time to throw the strike. Two rounds. Okay, if you found that easy, then you're a superstar and you get a gold medal. If you found that hard, good. Because if you're not finding, if you're not stepping outside of your comfort zone, then it's probably uh, time that you I uh, started doing something else like I'm um, trying to do it back to front or blindfolded. This next thing is really tricky. So I'm going to set a challenge for you. You're going to do one round now. This is the last round. This is a burner round. And what you're going to do is while you're mixing all your weapons in and you're um, taking into consideration all the rounds that we've done before and the, the learning objectives of each, is you're actually going to call out your work. So every time you do something, you're going to verbalize it and it's going to come out your mouth. And that's going to mean that everything you do is specific and deliberate. So for instance, uh, I start moving around and I throw a jab. I'm going to say jab, jab, jab. Long angle left, Fun check left, right kick to the body, trap the hands, transition through the range, sip knee, straight knee up the guts, parry the left hand, Fun sock, disengage, teep from long range to maintain the range, so on and so forth. See if you can do that. That's uh, expert uh, 75 Dan Coral Belt Muay Thai with Big Willie. All right, now that you're an expert in that, uh, let me set forth uh, a challenge. You know, we spoke about uh, one of the most awkward things about shadow boxing when you first get into the sport is that kind of self-conscious element of going, oh no, everyone's looking at me. Uh, what if I look silly? Who cares? Look at my haircut. I've got a mud flap on the back. I spent my whole life looking silly. Get over it. So get over it. Film yourself doing this challenge. So film one round of you shadow boxing in consideration of all those things we've spoken about and verbalizing everything that you do. Uh, post that hashtag uh, Big Willie Shadow Boxing Challenge uh, and the winner gets a, a free hiding from uh, Parker Creative maybe a beanie or a key ring or something. All right, go get them.